Every bubble uh, takes place with near perfect conditions and huge profit margins. And the market runs with that and assumes it will stay there forever. And of course, conditions mean revert, profit margins mean revert, and good times become bad times. I like to say 80% of the time the market is pretty sensible and doing a possibly good job of estimating value for all the companies. A little under 15% of the time, it gets carried away with optimism. And by the end of that time, it has nothing to do with actual earnings. It's all in the head, projecting out hundreds of years into the future, assuming that perfect conditions will stay perfect forever. And that is a problem. And the remaining 5% of the market gets carried away on the downside and starts to uh, be completely irrational, as it was beginning to be in March of 2009. It was getting pretty silly, pessimistic. I wrote a piece, Reinvesting Went Terrified, that by sheer luck came out the day the market hit, it, hit its low. And it said, get a policy, get a plan, present it to your committee or yourself, and start to throw your money back into the market. You feel paralyzed, everyone always does, and now's the time to wake up, the market is cheap. And of course that happened in 1974 and 82, which were classic lows when the market got down to 7 PE. And what I call terminal paralysis sets in, where you're so frightened you can hardly move. And that's, of course, as Warren Buffett would have said, that's exactly the time you have to buy stocks. Uh, and it's only 5% of the time. They're much quicker than the uh, crazy bull markets. In terms of the entire bear market, it uh, would be unusual for it to bottom out uh, anywhere near uh, this high. I would expect that by the low, that the S&P would have declined by 50% from the peak in, in real terms. So you do have to adjust the stock market for inflation. The trend in the market is a little over 4% a year. And as time passes, you should put that into the fair value. So a year from now, when the bear market might end, the uh, trend line value would be almost 3,000 on the S&P. Of course, there's no rule that says you stop at fair value. But typically, in previous big bubbles breaking, they go down below that. They went down below, of course, in the uh, housing bust of 2009. And they went down in, in every great bear market break, they went below trend, except in 2000. In 2000, the S&P was heroically overpriced. It came down 50%, but at 50% decline, it was only fair value. It only hit the trend and then bounced as uh, as the Fed raced to uh, re-stimulate. The Nasdaq went down 82. That's a lot of pain, and it's possible that would do that again. But, but you do have to adjust for inflation. There was very little inflation around in 2000, but this time, with inflation running at eight or nine, it does move the, the nominal value of the S&P upwards, and one shouldn't lose sight of that. I don't include the uh, classic fangs as uh, being in the super speculative category. I think you could throw Tesla in at its peak. That was super speculative, great company, a bit of a silly price there. But the others, like Amazon and so on, they're great companies, but I, I wouldn't have included them as super specs. And yes, they're down quite a lot, it's hard in a bull market to get your brain around what happens in a bear market. Let me go back to Amazon in the 2000 bust. It didn't just come down as its sales continued to grow. Of course, in those days, it didn't have earnings because it was running on borrowed resources. It was still growing like the wheat. It came down 92%, 92% with strongly rising sales, a brilliant, successful new idea that went on to own the world and be worth a fortune. How is it possible it came down 90%, 92? Think about that. Well, every, every period is unique. Um, the 70s had problems with the oil crises. You can call it one giant crisis or you can call it two or three, but in any case, it, uh, it triple, quadruple, quintuple the price of oil in a hurry. Uh, we'd come off 50 years of, of fairly stable, low prices, and they shot up and, and stayed up for a long time and inflicted enormous pain on the system. They lowered the growth rate. Why wouldn't it if you have to pay three, four times for your energy? And um, it also, of course, pushes up the price. So there's nothing like a, an oil price increase to increase stagflation, and it did. And this time, if you adjust for the passage of time, the price of oil is not as high 
uh, but it's still multiplied recently by three times. So that is imposing a pain on consumption and it's imposing inflationary pressure. We also have, because of the invasion of Ukraine, uh, we have uh, an, had some extra spikes in the price of food, fertilizer, and natural gas, particularly in Europe. The stock market is saying, whoops, there's so much damage from commodity price rises, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that uh, we're going to have a recession. But the recession isn't bad news because the recession is going to get the Fed back in, in our camp of uh, lowering interest rates again and helping stock prices. And we're looking out into the future and therefore that's a good news. So the fear of a recession becomes a uh, wishful thinking about future interest rates. And so the market gets a reprieve for a while. It's, um, it's quite remarkable, but it's fairly typical. I, I think in the longer term, forget the next few quarters, who knows what happens really. But in the longer term, we are really running the risk that this is back to the 70s. If I'd been asked to bet, would the Fed get inflation wrong when inflation came along at any time? I would have said, of course, they'll miss it, they'll be late, their responses will be pretty ill-judged. The Fed's record is terrible. What is impressive is how much room they have been cut by the market. I mean, the market is incredibly forgiving uh, to the Fed. The Fed happened for 20 years, 25 years, to benefit from that amazing era as 500 million Chinese uh, raced into the big cities and were plugged from marginal farming into highly profitable uh, industrial system. And then they joined the World Trade uh, Association and uh, made everybody's stuffed dogs and everybody's iPhones for that matter. During that, that phase, 500 million extra Chinese, 200 million Eastern Europeans plugging into, uh, away from communism into capitalism. That was a golden era, Goldilocks, if ever there was one. And the Fed got to take credit for that. Uh, they did nothing right, but they were seen to be presiding over low inflation and decent growth. The growth rate actually has slowed way down uh, since Greenspan. It was averaging uh, three and a half before Greenspan and averaging two and a half afterwards and today, more like one and a half. So it, it, it's done nothing in terms of increasing the growth rate, but superficially, it felt like a golden age because asset prices went up. Asset prices went up because inflation came down and rates were allowed to come down. And in the end, rates were forced down and low rates make uh, leverage uh, cheap, make private equity deals wonderfully easy and profitable, uh, and, and they push up the price of real estate and they push up the price of stocks and and that's the way it was and the fed gets credit for that uh, and it's due none its demerit accrues from the fact that it uh, kept on pushing down interest rates far too long and dangerously increasing inequality which as i like to say is the greatest poison in the system these days and it does damage the degree of inequality we have in the us now does damage the strength of the economy and it is probably part of the reason why the growth rate has slowed and continues to slow. We have uh, problems with the availability of plentiful cheap resources and uh, we have problems with plentiful cheap labor. The birth rate has crunched in every developed country except Israel and um, that's a very very important segment of the global economy to say the least. And every one of them has um, a population growth rate lower than replacement level. So in the end, after accumulating lots of older people as a higher percentage, we start to actually uh, have the population drop. Secondly, uh, we're 10 and 20 years in, depending on the country, into having smaller baby cohorts. So we know with absolute certainty, since they're alive already, the 20 year olds arriving in the marketplace uh, will be fewer and fewer for the next uh, 20 years. And we have not experienced this before. This has happened incredibly fast. China has gone from plenty of babies to a baby crunch uh, almost overnight. Their fertility rate that needs to be 2.1 is probably running about 
And even in the US, the UK, we're running about 1.7. We've never seen levels like this. So we're going to have a hard time getting enough labor. We're going to accumulate old people who are very resource intensive. They need a lot of medical care. They need a lot of people care. And we're not going to have all that many people there to look after us old fogies 